135, it's time to start this week's Ollie. And uh, Jane and I are both people who speak a fair amount in public, and we both admitted that we have a little stage fright before we started. That's why we were chatting on and off to kind of get ready for the delivery of uh, a wonderful program. Last spring, we here at OLLI were fortunate enough to hear from the writer Howard Norman about it was what, about what it is like to live with a poet. <laughs> Some of us thought maybe we could convince that poet, Jane Shore, to reciprocate and tell us what it is like to live with a writer. The very introspective poet decided that reading her poems out loud about her family, Howard, her daughter, um, Emma, who just came in today from out of town, and her surroundings was a better way for her to share her thoughts about life with Howard, life with Emma, her parents, and life in general. She's been published in The New Yorker, New Republic, Yale Review, has received a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Radcliffe Institute Fellowship, and has published six volumes of poetry. That said, is her newest um, publication, it's New and Selected Poems, a state treasure. Here is Jane Shore, the other half of the Norman Shore writing family to read her poetry. Thank All set? Excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now you might want to pull that down. Yes, because I'm short. Small. I'm small. I'm petite, as my parents used to say. A little bit more. Yeah, tell me if it's, if it's not good. Is that good, Matt? Is that good? Okay, so I'll I'll Start what, to it. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for inviting me, Senior Center. Now, see, now I feel like I'm re I really belong, because if it had been a couple of years ago, I would have said I'm not quite ready yet, but I definitely feel like I am. And thank you so much, and thank you for coming out on a really gorgeous day. I think our last gorgeous day this week. So I'll make it fast. Okay, I'm going to only read eight poems. Well, you know, so, um, so I grew up in New Jersey, North Bergen, New Jersey, over my parents' clothing store on the main street, right across from uh, Manhattan. And um, my poems are very autobiographical, as you will hear. And um, I, Mary gave you a very good um, introduction to me, so... Um, there, if you want to ask questions later, questions are always so embarrassing because people feel obligated. So maybe no questions, but we'll, let's see how we feel. And also, um, because it is beautiful out, um, and I'm also going to hawk my books. Um, the last, these are my, some of my favorite, uh, two of my favorite <laughs> books, and they're $10 each. So it's, if you want to, if, if you've lost yours or... <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this first poem is called Encyclopedia Britannica. We were as excited as when we bought our new car, and it too weighed a ton. The entire history of the world and everything in it, on two whole shelves in our family room sitting like a judge over our new color TV. We fact-checked over dinner to settle arguments erupting like Aetna, volume eight, <laughs> while the Caesar salad was being served. In which movie does Charlie Chaplin eat a stewed shoe? What was the exact date of Kristallnacht? Before we had our Encyclopedia Britannica, everybody had opinions instead of facts which they stuck to uncorrected unto death. But you couldn't pick a fight with the Encyclopedia Britannica, even saying its name up my IQ. It was written by Einsteins, by presidents and professors, 
people brainier than anybody in my house, on my street, in my town, experts, unlike my mother, who never even finished high school. Its index of topics was a book in itself, the history of the Persian Empire, the nine planets in our solar system, the anatomy of the polar bear. One day in high school, I looked up my name and wrote a report on the other Jane Shore, 1445 to 1527, the mistress of King Edward IV, volume 20. If my parents had had the Encyclopedia Britannica when they were deciding what to name me, would I have been a Jennifer instead of the penitent mistress of the king made to walk the streets of London barefoot? Now, over a century old, it resides in a climate-controlled storage unit on River Road in the cartons I packed after my parents died. It's bulging knowledge forever leashed together between covers warped and moldering. It's defunct contributors bulldozed under for eternity as in a family graveyard. It's Shah's replaced with Ayatollah's. It's Pluto demoted to an asteroid. It's endangered species now extinct. So I'm going to only read new poems. Um, that uh, I haven't, some of them I've never read, I think. Um, New York City for me, and um, although a lot of kids in high school never went to New York City, even though it was literally a half an hour away through the Lincoln Tunnel or the George Washington Bridge, they never went to the city. Um, but I did, and my eighth grade field trip um, was something that I will never forget. Um, and um, this is called Field Trip. Outside the Lowe's State Theater, where Ben-Hur had its world premiere, steps from strip joints and massage parlors. I'm holding my ticket to the matinee when a man breaks from the crowds of passers-by, bumps into me, and slips his hand between the lapels of my unbuttoned green wool coat and feels me up, my brand new breasts, then vanishes into the traffic of Times Square. Nobody sees it, nobody. Not the boys and girls lining up single file, not teachers and parent chaperones taking last drags of their cigarettes, not hookers lighting up at the corner, and not the camel cigarette man blowing smoke rings from his giant billboard, huge donuts of steam wafting over Broadway every four seconds. Inside the dark theater, my breasts burn under my pink and gora sweater. I don't come up for air until halfway through the movie when I see Charlton Heston shackled at the ankle, rowing in the bowels of a Roman slave ship among 200 other grunting, groaning men. He's wearing nothing but a loincloth. His biceps, torso, thighs, his entire body anointed with sweat. My breasts blush under my sweater. I've never seen a nearly naked man up close before. I don't tell anyone. I forget all about it until years later when Ben-Hur premieres on TV and every Easter Sunday thereafter, because Jesus is in it. His ageless face we never get to see, but Charlton Heston ages handsomely. Over time, his rich baritone deepens. He ditches the biblical robes and the beards and wanders in the desert for 40 years, his leathery skin curing in the California sun. He played God only once in a voiceover. Before we learn that smoking causes cancer, before CD Times Square becomes family fair, before Charlton Heston fondles a rifle and reinvents himself as the patriotic savior of his people, before we know about trigger warnings, PTSD, before I can brace myself and shut my ears, 
whenever I hear that voice, that sinewy, mellifluous, commanding voice, it's winter, 1960, around noon on Broadway, a month shy of my 13th birthday, I feel those cold, dead hands on my breasts. Um, because so many of you are friends and neighbors, um, I thought I'd also write about early Goddard, um, which is where I went to college, um, and uh, do not regret it at all. Um, and uh, it's always it's always a um, uh, a work in progress at Goddard. Um, so this poem is called Love Beads. The first line is a quote from, I stole it from uh, C.K. Williams, another poet. I wonder if there is anyone but me still living who remembers love beads from back in the 60s when I was a girl, about to start the hippie progressive college in Vermont that the catalog called An Experiment in Living, and which the boyfriend I met there, who became famous, referred to in the magazine article written about him as sex camp. <laughs> An hour into my experiment in living, my parents drove off in our orange mercury, that Cinderella pumpkin, and left me giddy at the ball. Not 10 minutes later in the co-ed bathroom, I saw my first naked guy in the bathtub washing a half dozen rocks the size of softballs with a sponge and a bar of ivory. Was he tripping? He barely glanced up when I barged in. Is there anyone still living who remembers carbon sets, dittos, and mimeograph stencils? Typing was a messy affair. The mimeograph machine cranked out poems trailing smeary purple fingerprints. The damp paper had a sweet, slightly chemical smell that got you high. That fall, I heard my first living poet when Allen Ginsberg read Howell in the cafeteria, after he announced that Plainfield, Vermont, my college's town, was the spiritual center of the universe. <laughs> At Dartmouth the week before, Ginsberg had declared Hanover, New Hampshire, the universe's spiritual center. <laughs> then he dropped his pants and mooned the crowd. But for us, no such luck. He sat cross-legged on the floor, chanting Om in front of the steaming trays of Salisbury steak and the vegetarian option, then danced around the room with his lover, Peter Orlovsky, while the rest of us ate lunch. I was from New Jersey. I never saw men waltz together before. Does anybody remember those long homemade necklaces we wore strung with colored love beads like the beads Indians from India wore, and Native Americans whom we also used to call Indians. The motto of our school was, learn by doing, Dewey. Like everyone else, I was a nonconformist, Thurber. I smoked weed, I made love, not war. I played guitar, I crocheted my own macrame plant hanger. I lay my head down flat on an ironing board and ironed my long black hair. The July after graduation, men walked on the moon. <laughs> Bottoms up. <laughs> Now, this poem is a Sestina. Um, it, all you need to know if you haven't read one or written one before is that there are six repeating lines at the end of six stanzas. The lines repeat six times. And um, because I had to be very tricky even to myself, most of the words are homonyms. So you're not supposed to actually catch them right away. So I'm not going to tell you what they are, because it doesn't really matter, I think. And this is called Ode to Joy. I never opened the spare bottle of joy 
She bought at a duty-free shop in Paris that for years lorded it over her Chanel No. 5 and Jerevienne. One whiff of those eau de cologne on my wrist evokes her world, but joy was my mother's signature scent long before I packed my Jersey accent and bell bottoms for my summer joy ride, my hippie grand tour of the world, the quintessential American in Paris, reading Hemingway and nursing a cafe au lait. It was different then, back in 75, when you could actually do Europe on $5 a day, pre-Euro, give or take a cent, using a student URL pass and the metro as if born to run was your ode to joy. My parents and I rendezvoused in Paris, au revoir, hostel, um, hostel, toilet down the hall, whirled my oyster. I unfolded the roll away and whirled in their jumbo tub, treated like royalty at the five-star Hotel Ritz, our first arrondissement Paris where Princess Di began her descent the night she died. Death's an awful killjoy. What killed my mother also killed Jackie O. Though I lost my dear one two decades ago, I held on to her souvenir of the world's most expensive perfume. An ounce of joy equals 28 dozen roses and 10,000 jasmine blooms. If I've forgotten her every so often, I'm innocent. My grief bottled up, vintage evening in Paris. If only Joy's glass bottle were plaster of Paris. I twisted the stopper, the bottle slipped, and oh, it broke in the sink, and her absence, a present, rose from the shards. Precious gold essence whirled through my fingers and down the drain in five seconds flat, like dish soap, like liquid joy. We'll always have Paris, but that lost world, I owe her, her Saks Fifth Avenue and my five and dime, exists in a present too late to enjoy. Actually, I lied in that poem because my parents still let us, me and my girlfriend, stay at a hostel. <laughs> I, did take a, I did take a bath, though, in the Hotel Ritz. That was good. So this is about um, one of the rights of motherhood. Um, your daughter, your child, getting chicken pox. And um, this poem is about me and our, my daughter and Ellen Voigt, the poet, and her daughter. And here we go. When the fever broke, Ellen phoned. Her daughter was still contagious. So I drove my daughter over. What kind of mother makes her child sick on purpose? Better to suffer now than later. The way that Ellen's daughter suffered her angry teenage skin, polka dotted with calamine, pink as the rosebud spangling her flannel nightgown. She dumped a carton of her old dolls on the braided rug. While Ellen and I drank coffee, our girls, one big, one little, played house all afternoon until the lights switched on and it was time to leave. When Ellen gave the signal, her girl, with the weeping sores, kissed my smooth cheek girl goodbye, a juicy smacker on the cheek. Then, in case the purpose of visit was lost to her, she licked my daughter's forehead twice. <laughs> Some kids get it so bad, it's like gravel inside your eyelids, throat, and crotch. Don't scratch, but who listens? Some kids itch so bad, their mothers clip their nails or make them wear mittens. My daughter's case was mild. Her first blister bloomed an inch above her belly button, then barely a rash, which she scratched, although I told her not to. I know how long some scars can last.
Um, I read this last time I was here in the, under the guise of Howard's wife. Um, <laughs> sorry, Howard. <laughs> um, and uh, in this one, um, but I thought that this this was this seemed relevant. Um, so um, especially since em Emma, I'm so happy she's not here at the reading because I would be really nervous then. Um, this is called symbolism. Um, I, you know, I, I just retired like in May after 50 years of teaching. Um, and uh, the last 35 of them were at George Washington University. Um, and um, so the, Emma's, in Emma's life, there's been a lot of talk about literature, you know, metaphors, similes, symbolism. Um, she's had to listen to a lot. She's really had to suffer. She's not an English teacher, doesn't, has no interest in teaching. But um, I thought I would read this one. Symbolism. Reading in bed, I hear my eight-year-old railing at her dad, who's downstairs, quietly trying to reason with her as she perches on a step halfway between our first and second floors, halfway between her father and me, the center hallway and echo chamber for her meltdown that must have started down in the dining room, dessert place still on the table, sparked with a teasing word, a joke misunderstood, the car of their argument accelerating from one to 60, her foot on the gas and her father the fuel. Daddy, you think I'm so stupid that I don't know what symbolism is? I know what a symbol is. A cloud is a symbol of sadness. A flower is a symbol of happiness. And you, Daddy, are a symbol of meanness. <laughs> I crack the door open and tiptoe down the stairs to sit on the step beside her, just as her father climbs halfway up, waving a box of Kleenex. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if, if this is true of your families too growing up. Um, my father's fought in World War II, and the men of today, as you know, are so different, but certain expectations were, were held in those days. This is a short poem um, called Our Fathers. During my father's married life, he never once did the wash. That was my mother's job. He'd fought in World War II, so wasn't he entitled to some pampering? Socks paired, his underwear folded, and shirts returned to the laundry from the laundry every week, six to a box. After our mother's funeral, my sister and I slept in our old bedrooms or tried to, opposite the shelves of yellowing mysteries we'd read as teens. We mothered our father, showed him cycles and rinses, and how you spin the dial like a combination lock, clockwise, but only clockwise, stopping precisely on delicates or permanent press. Obsolete as rotary phones, those men learned late in their lives to iron and to wash the cup they drank from. Men who never saw the inside of an oven, but who loved to barbecue outside the only ones allowed to touch the fire. So um, I have two poems to end with. Um, so both of these were in the New Yorker. And, uh, and um, one of them is local from here, from Peck Hill Road. And one of them is a New York poem. Um, both autobiographical, obviously. Let me just make sure I have the page. The Couple. 
Jay and Linda moved to Plateau Road and brought with them a pair of horses, old Kalua and his longtime mare. When her heart failed suddenly, Kalua, a paint the color of the Mexican liqueur and sway back like a hammock, went on a hunger strike. Fearing that he might die from loneliness, Jay and Linda heard about a donkey housed unhappily an hour north whose spouse likewise had died. Donkeys are stoic, disguising their pain, and we know grief is pain. They hauled him home, installed him in the barn to see if the widowers could get along, the odd couple of central Vermont. Nikolai, a Slavic name means victorious, conqueror of the people. And if that's so, he's won us over, my husband and me, Jody and David, Kathy and Eric, another long married on Peck Hill Road. Driving to town for groceries and gas, I shift, I shift my Subaru into neutral to admire our two old bachelor uncles, free ranging along the electric fence. Their partnership, so far, so good. Nikolai's fur, mottled gray and white like burnout velvet, gets waterlogged when it rains. Kalua's is waterproof. Nikolai's lovely floppy donkey ears are much larger than Kalua's, and he has a stiffer mane. His bray is not Kalua's pleasant whinny. His he haws like a wheezing accordion reverberate off our bedroom walls. I once saw Kalua bare his teeth like Mr. Ed, the TV horse who could talk. But they say that donkeys are more personable than horses, more affectionate than dogs, so it's easy to forget that he's a jackass, confined to the barn all freezing winter, tired of nipping at Kalua's flanks, he stomped Jay's pet rabbit to death. From afar, you cannot tell which one's the boss, albeit equal on the equine scale. On days when it isn't thundering, you'll find them both civilly ensconced, silhouettes grazing against the sunset, the moon rising over Max Gray Road. They stand head to tail or tail to head, their long tails ticking metronomes, flicking flies away from the other's eyes, their warm sides barely touching. Facing opposite directions, they'll age in place, bickering, companionable, a photo on a country calendar. I left a few neighbors out, <laughs> the ones I don't like. Okay, and this last one is a little longer, not horrible. Um, it's called The Hat. Aunt Roz lived above her means. Her one Abyssinian and three Siamese dined on calves liver delivered daily from the fancy butcher, not the AMP. Her pastel tripled milled French soaps Packaged like eggs, a dozen to a box, fragrant tuberose, lily of the valley, were superior to my mom's plebeian ivory. She worshipped culture, dissing her New Jersey barbarian sister, my mother, too busy working in our dress store to groom me in the arts. Roz got tickets for Price's Aida and the original West Side Story, she wangled box seats for us to hover above Arthur Rubenstein's right shoulder. She got me Maria Tallchief's autograph. Artistic, but no artist, Roz lived la vie bohème in her rent-controlled studio apartment a block from NYU, as if it were a garret in Montparnasse. Bookkeeper with a high school GED, she fancied herself an intellectual, Exclamation points stabbed the margins of her, of her Camus stranger and Paul Valerie. Raped at 13 was a story no one ever talked about. 
She grew up gorgeous, had a fling with fledgling Tumler, Danny Kay and the Catskills Hotel Resort, her first husband owned. No one's left to ask about husband number two. Saturday, she fetched me from ballet at the Metropolitan Opera House. We lunched at Lindy's, then bussed to the bottom of Fifth Avenue. Holding hands, we skipped through the streets of Greenwich Village, singing, and everybody smiled at me. At dusk, Roz unrolled the trundle bed. She baked fresh popovers for breakfast. She set up easels, oils, and canvases a still life of pears on her coffee table, and we painted all Sunday afternoon, alternating between the styles of Medigliani and Renoir. My love for her was unabashed. My parents tolerated our weekly tryst, but disapproved of Roz's extravagance while on the dole through family loans. Unemployed, she gained 100 pounds, and traded the mind for the body. Penguins morphed to harlequins, ferried by the bushel to and from the strand. I visited her until I started college, prowling 8th Street for beatnik sandals and hand-wrought jewelry. I bypassed her address. I had aunt fatigue. She wore me out. She embarrassed me. I blamed my absences on an allergy to cats, her cats, who one by one succumbed before Aunt Roz died in a nursing home when I was 40. Her Aquila Crusades, her beat up ebony coffee table, her flacons of cabochard all came to me. Custom made dresses from Bendel's, her still fabulous costume jewelry. No one in the family wanted them. And just today, I came across her hat, hibernating in its Bonwit Teller box, itself a collectible, nosegays of violets floating on white ground that's been lost in my closet for some 30 years. Genuine fox, Zhivago style, luxurious, silky, and perfectly preserved. The crown still stuffed with tissue paper, must have cost her three weeks' pay. Purchased, the sweatband label reads, in the Oval Room at Orbax on 34th Street, the department store where you'd shop for bargains, far from Roz's posh uptown salons. The hat doesn't look half bad on me, but wearing fur in public is not PC. Luckily, my nose begins to itch. My eyes water with unsentimental tears. Izzy, my gray tabby, sniffs the box, the crinkled tissue to his liking. He tamps it down and makes himself at home. He's not a pedigreed Russian blue, but a rescue adopted from a shelter. A pedestrian tomcat, according to Aunt Roz. Snobby, flamboyant, Ridiculous Aunt Roz, a Bonwitz hat in an Orbax box. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. And are you open to a couple of questions? Sure. Now I've made everybody so self-conscious. <laughs> Yes. I have a comment. I went to Goddard in 1966, and I was there when Ginsburg was, you know, and, and I could smell the cafeteria. I could, I mean, he really brought back amazing memories. Oh, it was amazing. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, Goddard's very hard to, you know, it was. It was, a, it was terrible. I mean, I just, I couldn't believe how many, you know, like, I'd gone from a high school where there was nothing to read, and I swear I ate a book a day. <laughs> was it the vegetarian option? <laughs> it was. It was. It was. It was. <laughs> yeah, it was very hard to explain. Very hard to describe it. It's nostalgic, right? 
Yes. It's not any particular words. It's just poems full of love. I'm sorry? They're full of love. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, and also I find, I mean, I'm at a point in my life where things are both kind of heartbreaking and hysterically funny. So, um, yeah. I had a friend who once said, no more jokes, but I couldn't help. <laughs> Another poet. Yes. Oh, well, thank you so much. You know, it's just, it's like they're embedded, it's embedded in your head. And uh, uh, it's very hard to explain it, I think, other than writing it. You know, you feel like an archivist or something. <laughs> but I'm so happy that, that it, I hope it was good memories. Okay. Yes? I, I love your poem about the encyclopedia of the encyclopedia. Oh my God. And we had one, and I remember there was a special table where you, the Encyclopedia <laughs> Britannica fit in the front and the back. And, and they, we, there's even one somewhere around here because whenever I see them, I go, oh, that's the table. And we got rid of the encyclopedia years ago. But I had that table <laughs> <laughs> and I gave it to my son, and it's like it will always be the encyclopedia, encyclopedia Britannica table. Did you have a table like that where they all fit? We had a shelf. Yeah. We yeah, had a shelf, but it all fit on one shelf. Oh, okay. And ours was, it was pretty long. And <laughs> most of it fit on one side, but there were some that fit on the other side. I have and to say. I just love that paper, you know, that very thin paper that it was on that was fantastic. I want to say, I, I'm try, I hope I can remember, but when this poem was published, actually the Encyclopedia Britannica people got in touch with me. Oh. And they said, well, we're so happy that we made you feel smart. <laughs> so. <laughs> yes. I don't think we did. I don't. I don't remember. I remember there was an atlas that was fantastic that had big dinosaur, you know, dinosaur pe drawings of dinosaurs and and that kind of thing. But yeah, no, it's you can't really find. I mean, you can find them, but they're not in great shape. And nobody feels like they need to read them either. So we we have the internet. Yes. Yes, um, I have to think of how to answer. The question is how do you, like what is the process of your writing poems? Is that what, from a first to a last? Um, oh God, yes, okay. Well, I, I, um, I am a perfectionist and um, unless every word is perfect, of course it can't be, but unless every word is perfect, sometimes I'll start out with, actually I read somebody else's poem about Encyclopedia Britannica, this guy named George Bilger, I don't know if, if, if you know his name. Um, he's very funny, so I like to read him, I get ideas. I get ideas also, like from other poets, sometimes like Sharon Olds, who you know, I think is often over the top, but she gets me going, um, Elizabeth Bishop, who I, studied with um, and was a colleague of um, any all sometimes all I need is one little thing um, in the Encyclopedia Britannica I, I stole the guy's idea you know the picture of the the idea of this 
group of things that are moldering that nobody ever reads. And then I said, I'm going to write my version of it. Um, so it starts like that. And then you go over it and over and over it. I'm, there's got to be 30 or 40 versions at least. Um, and um, I write now with the computer because um, it's fast. And also because, do you remember like those mimeographs? What I taught was like, in the old days, like even typing, like you'd have to type something over again on onion skin. And so, so anyway, that's, that's made my, I'm not, I'm not as like frustrated as I used to be. And then I show it to other to friends who are poets, and I've done that over the years. Nadell Fishman um, is one, um, and then I work on them until they're until I get them perfect. You know, a, who said the poem isn't finished; it's abandoned. It's an old, but um, you know, unless I can get it, and then I feel like, is this as good as the best poem in my book, or? I even think, is this line as good as the best line in this poem? And you know, you just have to hope. And uh, and and then I, you know, send them out and see what happens. So, um, did that answer? Yeah, I just work a long time, and my my um, models are perfectionists too. So, work on them. Sometimes you have to take criticism that you don't always like, but you know, it's often just exactly right what you needed. So, yes? Just, you know, follow up. Is, is reading out loud part of that process? Um, I don't really read it loud until I'm practiced, like, pra like this morning I woke up and I said, oh my God, I haven't read these poems. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I read them, I read them once through just so I remembered. But I, yeah, I definitely hear them. And, um, but I don't, but I, I'm very, I play the piano as a little girl and guitar, and so I'm very aware of the musical qualities of them. But, so I want them to be appealing um, audio in an audio way, but they're also writ very much written for the page, so. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you.